Hey, this is Jay with SureShot Night Vision. I'm going to be talking about some of the PBS 27 retube options, as well as our warranty services, collimation services, guarantees, some of the benefits to, to having a new tube put in. Uh, as these things came from FLIR and OSTI, they perform really well, and we all know that. I mean, they, they put out. With this big F1 cat lens, it finds all of the light, sends it straight to your tube, and you get the best out of your tube. Uh, they can usually, magnification wise, they can get up to, you know, 18, 22 sometimes if you stretch it, depending on how, how much blur you can deal with. Uh, but yes, definitely a long range clip on. One of the best, if not the best, it's arguable. Uh, with the Omni 7 tubes that they put in these, they, they still perform really well. But by retubing these things, <clears throat> putting the L3 filmless tubes in, you get much better low light performance out of these. Uh, basically all around better performance out of it. And we're also gonna be putting the 4G tubes in as well, the white phosphor 4Gs. If you want green phosphor, we can do that. We can put a Omni 1 variant tube in here if you want, it's up to you. We can retube them though. Um, the L3s are gonna give you much better low light performance. Phenomenally better than the only seven tubes that they got in there from ITT. Um, to the point where you will almost never need an illuminator unless you're shooting extreme long range, and, and I'll say extreme long range is you know, 800 more, you know. And depending on the lighting conditions, you could get out to 1,000 and well beyond with no illumination whatsoever. I've personally shot this unit out to a thousand yards with no illumination and no visible moon and no ambient light whatsoever. So, so they put out with the L3 filmless tubes. Um, this particular one here has a 22 UA, 72 line pair, uh, right at 35 signal noise, 0.4 EVI. It's a really good tube, uh, and it performs really good. Like I said, now if you want to go with some different options like the 4Gs. It's no secret, the Photonis 4Gs, they retain their highlight resolution better than the L3s do. Now they're lacking big time in the low light department, we all know that as well. Uh, if you're wanting to go completely passive, and you don't want to use an illuminator, you don't want the 4G in your 27. Uh, you'll hear my kids in the background are playing in the swimming pool, don't mind them. So if, if you want to go completely passive and not use an illuminator much for whatever reason, if you're using this on duty, you don't want a big laser beam showing the world where you are. So, so you won't want to be blazing around with a big high power illuminator just to see your target. So if that's the case, go with the Filmless L3. That's definitely going to be your best option. Whereas the 4G, if you don't mind using an illuminator, the 4G is going to retain your highlight resolution much better than the L3s do. Uh, this particular tube has a highlight resolution of 45 line pair, which is pretty pathetic to be honest. I mean, you got 72 line pair low light resolution, but as soon as you beam down on it with a PEX-15 or an NGAL or, or whatever, Radex, uh, Luna, like I've got on my rifle here, I'll show you in a second. As soon as you hit it with that highlight illumination, you're looking at 45 line pair. Whereas the 4Gs are gonna retain almost all of their, their low light, uh, high light resolution. So if you got a 68 line pair tube, uh, 74, 76 line pair tube, whatever it is on the 4Gs, you're pretty much looking at the same resolution under high light or low light. So if you don't mind using that laser to illuminate your target, 4G may be the way to go. And again, with the 4G, you're pretty much going to need some laser illumination or LED illumination, whatever, some artificial light in order to see those targets on those really dark nights. Now, this F1 cat lens is going to help that 4G big time. It's not going to be an end-all solution for it. It's still going to struggle when it's really dark like most all of them do. But this cat lens is really going to help it. Um, and this combined with the L3 filmless tube is unbelievable. It, if there's a light proton out there, it's going to find it for you and send it to your tube. And how these cat lens work, they're basically like a funnel. So it takes all of the light and funnels it down 
right to the input screen of your image intensifier, sending it right to the photocathode. So this big lens funnels right down to that small black circle that you see there in your input screen of your image intensifier. So they, dr they draw all of the light to your tube. So they get the best out of your tube. So like I say, I mean it works extremely good with the filmless tubes to the point to where you'll find yourself just leaving your illuminator at home when you would usually always pack it with your green PVS-27 like they came from FLIR. And if you want to go with the 4G route and have the high, the high light resolution, well, hey, you've got your lens helping out your 4G in those low light conditions. And then if you want to hit it with the illuminator, go ahead. Now we'll talk about line pair resolution. Most of these Omni 7 units, they came with a 64 line pair tube. Uh, anywhere in signal noise from you know 28 being your minimum on Omni 7 on up. You know, some of them probably into the the mid 30s on the really good ones uh, but most of the time you're looking at 64 line pair and roughly about 30 signal noise or so is what's average on these Omni 7 tubes. Now your signal noise is it's a big deal in a PVS 14 or an RMBG, DTMG, whatever, a non-magnified unit and that signal noise ratio is important in those. Now on these, any clip on night vision for that matter is going to be extremely important um, because now instead of it just being one power magnification we're going all the way up to, to 20 25 magnification higher if you want to really get crazy with it and those little small specks of scintillation in that pvs 14 are going to grow and get huge whenever we zoom in onto the output screen of these tubes here so those little small specks are going to be huge so signal noise ratio becomes very important whenever you start talking about a clip-on as well as line pair resolution. Line pair resolution of 64 versus 72 and even 81 line pair in a non-magnified unit is, I mean, it's, it's not the biggest thing. It's not what people think it is. You can have a 72 line pair resolution tube sitting right next to a 64 line pair resolution tube in two different PBS 14s and you won't be able to tell the difference. You can't look at them, you can't tell the difference between them. Uh, you can pass them off to anybody and they wouldn't see the difference. You're not zoomed in on that to really get the most out of it. So you're not noticing that small difference in line pair. And like I've said before in some other videos, just because it's 64 line pair resolution on the data sheet, it could be 71 line pair. And your 72 line pair tubes could be 72 line pairs. So there's a very small difference in between those. Now, on these here, once you zoom in, that difference between that 64 line pair tube and your 72 line pair tube, or they're going to be noticeable, very noticeable. A 64 line pair beside a 72 in one of these, you can tell the difference. Uh, Ray Charles could tell the difference. You, there's no doubt that the 72 has a better one, a better resolution. 81 line pair, yeah, you, yeah, you see it. You see every bit of it. So 81 line pair tube in one of these is going to be phenomenal, it, especially if it's an 81 line pair in a mid-30 signal noise ratio. It's going to be ridiculous. So I can find whatever tube you want. If you're, you're looking for 72, if you're looking for 81, I mean, obviously there's not a, a, a pile of them out there. If I can find you one, I will. I'll put it in here for you. Now, on the, the 4G tubes, it's a little bit more typical to see some of those higher resolutions. Uh, not as common as you would hope, but there, sometimes you see some into the 80s and stuff. Uh, I can take one of those. I can put it in here. And then you've got that high light resolution as well as your low light resolution. So, again, there's that. Uh, collimation. When it comes to collimation on these things, this is your Risley prism right in here. Now, this thing adjusts. Your tube is sitting in here just like this. Now, how that Risley prism adjusts is going to play a big factor in your point of impact. Uh, some of these things come from the factory. They claim 
half minute of angle. You see some places they claim one minute of angle, whatever Fleer was thinking that day. Now, I've got I've got one right here. This particular unit is a factory FLIR OSTI unit. It's got the Omni 7 tube just like this one. Now, this thing looks like it's never been mounted. I mean, it's practically a brand new unit. This thing is 4, M four MOA high and 1 MOA left on windage. Way off. Uh, that's neither half minute or one minute. They're way off on both of those. So, I mean, most all of these refurbs that you see on the used market, they're, they're way off. Some of them are within a minute, not very many, but some of them are. Um, this one here, the, this unit with the 22UA that I've retubed, this one is within a half minute. It's been tested. I have 300 rounds under this thing, and it's not moving. It's it's dead. It's there. This one is not shifting either, but it's four in my way off. So I guess if, if you you're okay with that, you can dial it out and make the best of it. Recoil rating. Um, these come from a factory with a BMG recoil rating. Put it on anything. You mount it on a Sherman tank barrel if you want to. I mean, they're, they're known to withstand whatever recoil you can throw at them. These that I'm retubing, I wouldn't say that. Um, and here's why. These tubes that came in these FLIR units are F9815WGs. And the main difference in that tube and the tubes that you'll find in the Omni 7 PBS 14s or, or PBS 15s or whatever these tubes have a bigger halo, much bigger halo. Uh, I think the minimum on the WGs, don't quote me on this, I want to say it's 1.0 on the halo and it can go as high as 1.4. And again, I may be a little off, but they've got a big halo to them. Now, that makes them less acceptable to recoil damage or vibration damage in, in any sense. So, these tubes that we're putting in here typically have a much smaller halo. Now, the only other people putting these tubes in night vision clip-ons is L3, and they put them in the CNVDs, the CNVD LRs, PBS 24s, whatever you want to call it. And they actually have a white phosphor filmless L3 tube in some of those. They're not readily available, but they are out there, and they're recoil rated to 308 Winchester. Um, that's kind of what I'll say these should be recoil rated to because the halos are much smaller. I won't get into why that is the reason, but a smaller halo tube is more susceptible to recoil damage than a larger halo tube. It's, it's a lot into that. I won't get all into that, but that's, it is what it is. This particular unit has a .8 halo. So I tried to find the best specs possible with keeping a pretty high halo to make sure that it's not gonna get recoil damage the first shot I fired through. And this one is held up to 300 rounds of 308 on a very lightweight carbon fiber 308 at that, so. I don't recommend you shoot these on your 300 Win Mag or, or your, your SCAR even. It, don't, don't beat on it. I mean, I'm beating on them pretty bad with these carbon fiber, this carbon fiber barrel on my little 308, it's a lightweight rig, but I don't suggest putting it on something that's known to kill optics. Um, I can't recoil rate these as far as warranty goes because of that. If you take it and you mount it on an M60 and you put 6,000 rounds through it and you recoil damage the tube, I can't warranty that. I, I mean, you send it to me and say that you had it on a, a 22 long rifle and recoil damage that, well, I can't do that. So. Uh, the SMB filters for these. I'm sure you may have seen the SMB filters that we're using on PBS 14s. Uh, they greatly improve the looks of your tube, especially if you have a lower signal noise ratio tube. They seem to increase your signal noise ratio. No, it doesn't. It doesn't increase the signal noise ratio. It just makes it look better to the eye if you've got a pretty nasty tube. Uh, mid, low 20s, something like that, and, and we're even using the SMB filters on high 30 signal noise ratio tubes. It's always going to help, it, but it greatly improves the ones that have lower signal noise ratio. We're making SMB filters for these also. 
my machinist is working on housing to where we can put it right in front of the output screen here. It's going to protect your lens and it's also going to give you the benefits of the SMB filter. So some of the pictures and videos that you'll see through these kind of have like a purplish hue looking through them. And that's because I have some, some test filters that I've made for these to play with that. So uh, these are just simply white phosphor. They don't have a purple tint to them. You have to get the SMB filter added on in order to get that look. And it does greatly increase the, the looks of the tube with the SMB filters. So the SMB filters help a lot on these clip-on night vision units. Those small specks of scintillation, when you zoom in, they, they become huge and it, it just looks like a black and white TV with lots of static. Uh, the SMB filters help that out big time because they reduce the amount of scintillation that you see. It, it doesn't make it dissipate at all, it just hides it from, it from your eyes so you keep a cleaner image. All right, the warranty on these that we're gonna be offering is a bumper to bumper warranty. If anything goes wrong, as far as the collimation gets off, your tube won't power on. If your manual gain stops working in your potentiometer here, if your tube won't turn on, if anything like that happens, I'll fix it for three years. Um, that could change. I'm thinking three years now, I could extend that. I don't know, it, it, this is all new. So the only thing that I will not cover on these, like I said before, is the recoil. Um, it's, it's just not feasible. I mean, I've, I've taken these, I'm taking these and putting them on this 308 and I'm putting 300 rounds under every single one of these that I retube, uh, that I sell. If I collimate it for you, you send your unit in that's seven, eight MOA off, I recollimate it, I'm putting 300 rounds under it before I send it back to you. I don't want to send you something and, and a week down the road your collimation's off again. So. I'm testing every one of these very thoroughly. Um, again, if anything goes wrong, if your focus gets out of whack to where you, your infinity's off, you just it won't focus. If anything happens with that, if your mount comes loose, if your mount breaks, if your potentiometer stops working so your manual gain doesn't work, your power switch doesn't turn on, uh, your battery it seems to just, it just won't get any power, whatever. Anything you can do to this thing, I'll fix it, except for recoil. Um, if one guy takes it out there, mounts it on his 300 wind mag and full auto something down and, and recoil damages his tube and tells me that he had it on a 22, I can't recoil rate it because of that. Um, I don't have any proof of what you had it on. I hate that it is like that. I would like to cover everything, but this is new to me too. I mean, we just took on this challenge about two months ago and we're trying to offer something that we know a lot of people will like. I like it. My passion is long range clip-ons and shooting long range at night. So I want one of these just as bad as some of you guys do. So like I say, if anything goes wrong, I'll cover it. Also, if you send it back for warranty work, if, if your, your tube won't power on, anything like that, you're going to get priority over the guys that are also waiting to get theirs retubed. Um, I have to make sure I wish, you know, I have to make sure that I have a good customer base. I want to take care of my guys. If anything happens, I've got you, and I've got you as soon as possible. So if I've got two or three guys waiting on a retube, and you send me one, and your focus won't won't adjust anymore. I'll try to fix it as fast as I possibly can. You're not going to have to wait until I get done with these five other guys' units. So I got to keep the ones that I've done in working order. If, any, if anything were to go wrong, I'm going to fix it as soon as I can. Um, I'm going to go over a couple basics and, and a couple of the most commonly asked questions. This is my little rifle that, that I'm shooting and testing these things on. It's a proof research barrel, surgeon action. Uh, this is a 3 to 12 smitten bender. I usually use a 3 to 27 for my testing for these so I can raise my magnification up and test them. Uh, take that out. Now, on these PVS 27s or, or any clip on the PVS 22s, you'll, you'll see a lot of people asking 
the surgeon rifles, the surgeon actions have, a, I think it's a 25 MOA cant built into the rail that's machined onto the action already. And then this, this rifle here has a Badger EFR bedded into the matter stock. So a commonly asked question is your alignment for your clip on and your day scope. A lot of people think that this is a huge deal. It's not. Um, the only thing that is important is your line pair resolution is read from the very center of your tube, not the edge. The edge looks nowhere near as good as the very center. That's the only thing that matters when it comes to your alignment and your misalignment on your tube. So if you've got really tall rings or something, and, or you've got really low rings, and this thing's sitting like this, and you're looking through the bottom edge of your prism, your image isn't gonna be as clear as it could possibly be. Your zero, your point of impact, your collimation, none of that changes, none whatsoever. When I have these on the collimation table, you can raise them up in the front, you can lean them down, you can go side to side, whatever you wanna do, the point of impact just never changes. So if you've got this thing mounted on your rifle like this, which is obviously not a good idea, but if you can see through it, you're going to hit where you're aiming, if it's collimated correctly. So that's a very commonly asked question on your alignment, usually because somebody's running a 25 or 20 MOA rail and then their Badger EFR is flat, it doesn't have any adjustment, it uh, doesn't have any can in it. Doesn't matter, trust me. I thought it did too. After putting these on a collimation table, doesn't matter at all. It's completely pointless. Get it lined up to where you get a, a good image through them and leave it alone. It doesn't matter if you have a you have a 50 MOA base, doesn't matter whatsoever. Alright, now this is a light shade. This particular one's from my comment. It can be whatever. You can make these out of a beer koozie. Um, most all of these PBS 27 kits come with them already in there. All that's going to do is shade if you've got a street light in the distance, your buddy's beaming a PEC 15 down right next to you or whatever. If you've got any ambient light in here, uh, you don't want it reflecting off of your output window on your, your clip on and giving you any type of reflection that's going to cause some distortion in your image. So you can buy these, they usually come with the kits, whatever, but that's going to help your image substantially. So these right here are very useful, especially on a full moon night, because you'll get a lot of reflection in there and it'll, it'll ruin what you're trying to look at. So those are very beneficial. Uh, as far as your gain, also, like we talked about before, your signal noise ratio is way more important in here than it is in a PBS-14 because you're zoomed in on the, on the imperfections. So, on your gain adjustment, on your potentiometer, whenever you turn these things on, they're, they're wide open, they're cranked back, doing all they can do. And then as you roll it back, you start to dim your image down. Now that does two things. Whenever you roll your potentiometer back and you dim it down, you're doing two things. Number one, you're turning down your voltage to your micro channel plate. So your noise is going to start to dissipate as you come down on your potentiometer for your manual gain. And also, you're killing the power, you're cutting your voltage to your phosphor screen, which is your brightness that you perceive with your eye. So by turning down your phosphor screen, you just dim in the image. So if it's too bright on your eye, you come back on that, you dim it some. And also, in turn, you're making your signal noise ratio go through the roof. The signal noise ratio on your data sheet, let's say you have a 32 signal noise. That signal noise is read with your tube running at max capacity, with your variable gain running wide open. Now, as soon as you tone that down just a little bit on your manual gain and you cut the voltage to the micro channel plate, then your signal noise goes from 32 to through the roof. Who knows what it is? They don't read it up there so we don't know, but your signal noise goes through the roof as soon as you tone it down just a little bit on your potentiometer. Now, like I said before, signal noise is very important in a clip-on because you're zooming in on that scintillation and it looks way bigger than it would in a PBS-14. If you roll your potentiometer back 
and get that signal to noise ratio up, cut some of the voltage on that micro channel plate, and stick an SMB filter on the back of one of these, the image that I'm seeing is unbelievable. It's something that we would, we all want. I definitely want it. You'll want it too. Um, some of the videos and stuff that we've got coming will be able to really harp on that and show how important that is. Alright, going over some wait times here on some of these things. Uh, I'm thinking three to four weeks I should be able to have one. You send it to me, hopefully max four weeks later I can have it sent back out to you. And here's why I say it takes so long. These tubes here are epoxied into a tube retainer. And this epoxy is from 3M and it takes, depending on temperature and condition, environmental conditions, they can take up to, uh, I think it's 12 days set time. Or they can take up to 12 days set time before it's completely hardened. Uh, so whenever I put your tube, if I find you a tube, I put it in the tube retainer, first things first, that has to harden before I can start collimating. Collimating itself can take several days. I can put it on the collimation machine and I can walk the reticle in to where it's perfect. Exactly perfect. The first shot after that, the prism is going to walk. It doesn't matter how tight you get it. It's going to walk around. First few shots it's going to be around and then it'll finally settle where it's going to be. So just the collimation process itself takes a couple nights worth of going and shooting and actually testing to see if the collimation holds and where it settles at. The collimation process paired with the epoxy setting for two weeks max, usually about seven days it's hardened, but I'm giving it a few days after to make sure that it's, it's good and settled before I start collimating it. So those two paired together, it's going to take me roughly three, maybe four weeks max. Now, we're offering coatings on these things. Uh, we can get them if, if yours is scratched up, beat up, whatever. If you want to just get it recoated black, uh, flat dark earth, OD green, if you want it hot pink, maybe you live in San Francisco, I don't know, that's up to you, but we can get it whatever color you want. But my coating guy has quoted me on two to four weeks on our coating, so if I've already got your unit for three weeks and I'm done with it, send it to him, hopefully we can still get you out within that month, but it could take longer. So it's just going to depend on my coding guy. He's really good. He does great work, but he may take a little while on that. So that's what we're thinking on wait times. Uh, and it would be good if I've got about three or four of them to do at one time. That way I can epoxy all four tubes in at one time. They can all set at the same time. And then when I go to do the collimation, I can do four at a time. So I'm willing to take up to about four in at a time and, uh, and just do them all together. And then, I mean, if I've got one or four, they're still all four going to take about a month to do. And if I've got four to send to my coding guy, then uh, he can get all four of them out within the same time. So, so that's that on the wait times. That's what we're, we're guesstimating. And again, that four weeks of just retubing it, collimating it, getting it back to you, that's max. I'm hoping I can do it half the time, but I would, would go, for a, go for a month or so. Uh, that's about all I've got for this video. I appreciate y'all watching. If you've got any questions or concerns, please feel free to call me, uh, text me, hit me up on some forums, email, whatever. I'm always available. I don't have business hours. So. If there's any questions you got, give me a call. I'd like to explain some stuff to you. Thanks for watching. And this is our factory OSTI collimation. Our aiming point, and these are our two zero shots with the rifle before it got dark.
No clip on. This shot here was right after it got dark. We put 150 rounds through it tonight. Walk out to a thousand and back down to a hundred. And this is our second one. So, basically identical on collimation. 